Thanks for staying with us here on the Urban Debate. We move on to conversation number two. The biggest talking point really across the world right now, once again, is what caused the coronavirus? Was it really an infection and a virus that came from an animal, from a bat, and then got passed on to the humans? Or was it created and then leaked from a Chinese lab? The focus of the entire world now seems to be on China. After the United States and the U.S. President actually recently asked the U.S. intelligence agencies to again investigate into this. And why has this happened? Because of another report that's come to light now, a report that was actually uh, conducted earlier and has now come to light that suggests that it is a possibility that the virus leaked from a lab in Wuhan. And now this is what everybody is looking at saying that, okay, Perhaps we need a further investigation. The study itself says that there is evidence and this hypothesis deserves a further investigation. Now, let me just really put some perspective here and then we'll get in experts on this as well. How did it all come through? A bunch of amateur sleuths have been hunting for clues on the internet largely, sharing information chatting over Twitter threads about all the information available on what really led to COVID-19 gripping this entire world. These are largely independent correspondents based in many parts who came together. They created a group which is the decentralized, radical, autonomous search team investigating COVID-19. That's what they call themselves. In, in, in short, it's called drastic. And these are the amateur sleuths who are now creating ripples with their findings. They've been at it for a while, keeps popping up on places in internet, but now it's garnered a lot of attention. Now, so it all started with them sharing information, getting into occasional uh, spats and arguments with scientists, many of the scientists who disagreed with this whole uh, theory that this could actually be a virus leaked from a lab. And so those conversations continued with various kinds of interpretations on what evidence you really have. But this group called Drastic continued with its research and information sharing, hunting for documents. They continued to share and discuss all of this on social media. And this is what they seem to have found. That this lab in Wuhan, remember that's where COVID really broke out, this lab in Wuhan had collection of coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. So their coronavirus-19 is actually a much later version. There are many other forms of this virus that have been under study for a long time. And this lab had a collection of some of these viruses that were found in a mine shaft and were under study. So the lab was already working with one kind of coronavirus and this lab the study suggests had inadequate safety protocols thereby the possibility indicating the possibility that there could have been a leak the study these findings also talk about various attempts by the Chinese government to conceal the activities of what was going on in this lab for example there were three researchers that act, who were working on this study who fell ill in 2019, seriously ill. And, and attempts were made to cover that up. This is just one of the examples. All of these individual data points and information has been collated together to then raise a question mark again. If indeed this was a created virus, not a natural virus found outside, which got leaked from a lab in China, and then did the Chinese government make an attempt to cover it all up? And now calls are growing louder for a thorough independent investigation. This is what we want to talk about. I want to talk about what these various evidences are. I want to talk about how scientifically we can find out or cannot find out the origin of the virus that's plaguing us right now. I want to talk about if indeed there is truth to this lab leak theory. What can the world do about it? In what ways can we make, will we make, should we make China accountable for it? 
And so we have experts from various fields right now joining us on this conversation. Abhijit Ayer Mitra, a senior fellow at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, joins us this evening. Ashok Sajanhar, former diplomat with us this evening as well. Professor Harsh Pant, Director for Studies and Head of the Strategic Studies Program at ORF, joins us this evening as well. Dr. Vinita Bal, Scientist and Guest Faculty uh, at Pune Specialization, with, uh, at an institute in Pune with a specialization in immunology. And Dr. Raman Ganga Khedkar, former Head for Epidemiology and Communicable Diseases, ICMR, joins us this evening. Dr. Ganga Khedkar, I want to start off with you to just put this in perspective on various ways that could be there for us to find out whether a virus and COVID-19 specifically, uh, you know, emerged naturally or could it have been created in a lab? How do we find that out? No, no, it's, it's, if you actually look at it, perhaps this task, if we were to undertake, would have had been made easier if there was complete transparency and people could have had probed into it. The reality of life is, you know, either this virus has jumped from bats with another intermediate host to human beings, or it is also possible that there, there was an accident in the laboratory because basically these laboratories which they were requiring for such kind of studies should have had higher biosafety lab levels no, to, to be in place. But at the same time, there are certain things which we have to keep at the back of mind. We, we need to give, we need to think before we label anybody no, that the, the transmission, perhaps that jump into human beings has occurred because of an X event. We need to ask ourselves many questions. One thing which we need to know is, do we have a definitive evidence? Perhaps we don't have. But at the same time, do we have corroborative evidences? We have. But at that juncture, we should also think that this evidence that we are treating, we are looking at that uh, mine shaft isolate, which was RATG 13. And this was actually pointed out by the researchers themselves. But if, we had, if it had 96% homology, it just doesn't necessarily mean that we have, we have access to the virus which has actually jumped from the bat to human species per se. If you go by, if you look at HIV, we essentially said that the virus has jumped from monkeys, you know, different monkeys for HIV 1 and 2, to human beings. But did we make an effort to see whether that was closely uh, homologous sequence per se? Perhaps, you no. Know, or how did it come in? It was extremely difficult. No, that task was never undertaken so so well at that juncture. But given the fact that this could be one of the weapons in biological warfare, there is a big scare. There, there is no denial that we don't have evidence to say that it has jumped in a particular manner and come into human beings. There is no denial that can this occur due to lab accidents, which are as common in the labs, and we know if they are not represented or if the evidence is wiped out, perhaps things could be different. But we need to wait for evidences to emerge before we say, take a definitive stand one way or the other. But are there any such, uh, you know, attempts being made, Dr. Vinita, like uh, Dr. Ganga Khedkar was pointing out? This requires a lot of transparency from that one nation and, and, and those labs, if at all we have to look at it. Are there other ways without going there, getting into it to find out if it was an accidental leak or something natural? Uh, I think we need either Inspector Morse or Hercule Poirot to get to the bottom of it because this is this has really become a detective story in one sense. Unless there is an enough evidence available, nobody will be able to uh, arrive at a conclusion as Dr. Ganga Khedakar himself was saying. It's also true that not all bat viruses are um, this, this dangerous as this SARS-CoV-2 has turned out to be. So the lab in Wuhan where uh, there is work going on on bat viruses is also something that could have been 
sort of a normal activity and there are possibilities of leak and leak is not only restricted to china and again many hi very high security labs in united states in england many other countries there have been such leaks and there have been minor or somewhat major disasters this disaster seems to be at a much larger scale so i gather that all the information that was there with the scientist uh, uh, dr zeng li that uh, those data or those notebooks have been sealed this is also something that is common it's not just china but anywhere else it would have happened this this was likely to be the situation but so in that sense china is not an exception the problem is that whatever damage has been done has been done and what can we do because accidents are accidents after all i do not see this as a bioterrorist attempt per se because people have been researching for bioterrorism including united states so united states in itself would not have a voice to say that china is at fault and we are not at fault or anybody else all superpowers do do that so that is a problem and as i uh, said while who did one round of investigation another rounds can be can be done but at the same time unless what has been sealed off it comes out if it is still there that that will have to be checked out and also it has been more than a year and i'm sure it was not december 19 when this first came out of the lab it must have predated that so how far back can we go and actually find biological evidence for this not just the records in the lab but biological evidence for this <clears throat> is is a debatable issue and i think that is where the situation will stand today so 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 let me ask this question before i go to our other experts scientifically speaking with the virus that we have that originated uh, from china and then spread elsewhere which we can study we we don't know what happened at the lab itself but with the virus that we do have is there a way to find out uh, whether or not this this can uh, evolve naturally or could it have been you know manually mutated in some way apparently and in this sense i am not the real molecular expert who can do talk about this but wherever i have looked at molecular virologists looking at the so called signatures they tend to think that it is unlikely but again people who have done the drastic kind of investigations that you were mentioning those kinds of people also say that no 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 this is this particular um, uh, changes that have been made the way it smoothly started getting transmitted into human beings indicates that it was adapted already in the lab for human transmission so these again as i said are speculations for that unless there are data available and as a scientist i would like to say this again and again that speculations hypothesis is what we base our investigations and experimentation on but unless there is supporting evidence it's not easy or it should not be uh, the conclusion should not be drawn so in that sense it's a unsatisfactory situation but there are no clear answers you know you you said uh, the you used a very interesting phrase and dr ganga khedkar Uh, for scientists and researchers this is an unsatisfactory situation would you at least be you know uh, would you at least want a another independent investigation to be carried out to really get to the root of this absolutely i think that is necessary for different reasons please remember before i go to that issue what we need to do uh, what i would say is you know we are taking prima facie as if that ratg uh, 13 was the uh, intermediate virus then that was actually the one which has which has perhaps evolved a little bit we don't know we don't have so many bad genomic sequences that are available to know know from where and how it has come just a mere pointer towards a, a cave where they went and tried to study and some people perhaps developed illness is not enough uh, to say that this this is the point in time where the things have jumped but it is essential that we need to study this there are multiple reasons one reason which i feel which we need to understand is we here we are dealing with 
BSL three or four labs. No, these high security labs in essentially actually vouch that the there will be no such accidents, and if the accidents occur, what all precautions they would take subsequently? What are the measures? How do they report? There is an international treaty. No, where they say all such accidents have to be reported across, but if that is not happening, I think that's that's poor governance in the lab, which has to be rectified. How would we try to mobilize the entire world and try to develop guidelines, some checks and balances that such a thing never happens? If it was unintentional accident, as we would like to believe, because we mm -hmm. don't know enough yeah. about it. The second issue, which is also important for us to understand, is if this jump in species has really occurred in this particular manner due to experimentation, there are huge issues, diplomatic issues that will arise yeah. as to what we should be doing. How do we even go for uh, forensic audits to find out whether this was intentional or uh, unintentional? And what do we do to such countries? So there are huge ramifications to my mind. Investigations are warranted, but I would also request one way that we should not be focusing more on this issue at a time where if we all spend more time towards finding out the remedy or a good vaccine that could prevent this infection, perhaps we would have sufficient time, so many people who yes. would think about what should be done uh, and find out why it has occurred. Okay, fair enough. A bunch of them, though, are amateur sleuths. Uh, and I don't know if they will be capable of giving us the treatment drug. But yes, that's uh, equally essential as well. Now that you've mentioned the uh, larger ramifications of if indeed um, this is true, uh, and then what should we do? Let me bring in our other set of guests. And Professor uh, Pant, let me start off with you. At least to begin with, is it high time that we make China a little bit more answerable uh, as to what really went on there. Bio-warfare is no more, you know, uh, a plot for sci-fi TV serials and movies anymore. It's, it's real and it's here. Uh, and we need to somehow figure to make these countries at least transparent about what's going on. See, at a, at a minimum, this is... Uh extreme degree of negligence on China's part, uh, which I think, uh, you know, the two speakers who were mentioning earlier, uh, they talked about, you know, how laboratories are maintained, how they are, how, what kind of governance structures they have, and how should we make, how do we ensure that this happens across the board? But, you know, beyond that, this is something very, which is very fundamental in terms of what is happening to international politics today. We are looking at, at a complete collapse of global governance. And at the end of the day, this is a question of global governance. Here is a country that claims to be a rising power, that claims to be a power that is now supposedly will lead international uh, politics, it, it will, will, wants to emerge as a leader in international politics, and yet does everything in the last 18 months to demolish it, its claims of being a responsible stakeholder. Now, A, it was never a stakeholder for many countries, including India. But I think on this question, when it comes, you know, when it is an issue of public health, where you would assume that uh, at the end of the day, zero sum games would be can be sidelined, and perhaps the international community can work together. What have we seen? We have seen a country that does not, that refuses to disclose relevant information, that uh, you know, that remains ambiguous about the origins of this problem. Then it arm twists international uh, organizations, leaders of the, the, those organizations, when they try to conduct uh, initial uh, you know, uh, research and investigation, that does not happen. Finally, when that happens, we come across a situation where no evidence, uh, nothing uh, that was given uh, to the investigators to come to any lo logical conclusions. So I think broadly, we are looking at a, almost a rogue behavior from, from a country that claims to be a, you know, a rising power or, or an emerging power or a global power. Now, so the challenge is for, for all of us, uh, you know, what, what can we do about it? And I think as we are pointing out, it's an extremely difficult question. You know, Chinese can always claim plausible deniability and that's the space that they want to operate in, right? Gray zone operations. Now, this is an absolute gray zone. They yeah. can always claim that nothing happened. They can say nothing happened. We don't have any evidence. And even if other intelligence, uh, you know, other countries are trying to push their boundaries, they will often say, well, this is something that is beyond your jurisdiction. 
So I think at the end of the day, every country is on its own here, and we'll have to figure out a response to it uh, with like-minded countries and hopefully some kind of pushback against a rogue actor. Well, okay, no, you're fair enough. And let me also say that while China often is, you know, referred to as the rogue nation for on, on several aspects, not just when it comes to this instance, uh, I think in this scenario, if it was any other country, nobody would have probably come clean very easily on what really happened, whether they, it came from a bat or if it, it was an accidental leak and they were intentionally working on, on, on something that they would have used against the world later. Uh, Mr. Ashok Sajanhar, is it a road worth taking? Will we get anywhere, even if the nations combine to say, tell us what you did, and here are the sanctions, here is how we are going to punish you for it? No, absolutely. I definitely think it's a road worth taking, and I think we have taken that road, because otherwise, what is the alternative, Tanvi? The alternative is that you sit back and do nothing, and I don't think that's an alternative. So I think what we really need to do, meaning uh, there are... Uh, across the spectrum, you know, a, number, a couple of uh, scenarios that you can try to create. One is you will get all the scientific evidence that you want so that you can, you know, uh, affix uh, blame on uh, the country, on the individuals. That, I think, is going to be very uh, difficult uh, that, uh, to sort of, you know, conjecture. But I think you might be able to get a lot of circumstantial evidence as to how did this all come about. You know, now in uh, the United States, Dr. Fauci has asked for, you know, blood samples and all the other reports of the 2012, you know, what Dr. Kanga Ketkar and uh, Dr. Vinita Bal, they were talking about that that is what happened. So I think if you want to have uh, 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 an investigation which is credible, I think you need all that information. Also, the, they have asked the blood samples of the three researchers who fell uh, sick uh, before uh, November 19. You know, that is what you referred to. So yes. at least we will be able to see what, uh, uh, you know, evidence we have and which direction it is pointing. Now, is uh, China going to uh, share that information? I doubt it very much. And, you know, circumstantially, what we also come to realize here is that if China had nothing to hide, would it be sort of, you know, behaving in the manner in which it is behaving? I take the point that is uh, being mentioned that, uh, you know, these uh, leaks do take place. They have taken place in other cases also. But then if you are researching on a virus and, you know, I think going forward, we'll come to know about it. I'm not an epidemiologist, I, but what I have read is that this virus was artificially spliced and artificial uh, you know, proteins were int introduced in it to make it much more virulent, much more lethal. So, you know, if uh, something of this nature was happening in the laboratory, and even if, you know, to give the benefit of the doubt to the laboratory that it escaped, then wasn't it incumbent, wasn't it necessary for the scientists and for the political leaders, because obviously in China, nothing happens uh, without the uh, okay from the highest uh, uh, leadership, that they should have forewarned the world. Like they sort of, you know, kept a quarantine on Wuhan. No one from Wuhan would be able to travel anywhere else in the country. But people from there were free to travel to Italy, travel to US, so that, you know, the virus went around the world but as far as China was concerned, they have been able to control it. Mm. So as I said, hard scientific evidence might be difficult to come by. The last point Tanvi I'll make here is, why is it essential to do this investigation? Not only in terms of, you know, meaning I uh, have a slight difference of opinion with Dr. Ganga Ketkar when he says that, you know, we should be focusing on finding a cure rather than sort of, you know, expending our energies in this. I think if we know the source, the origin, the manner, the composition, et cetera, it will make us uh, much better equipped. It will equip us much better to deal with it and to find a cure for it. Vaccine is not a cure, but you know, to get a cure, I think we really need to find how did it originate, where did it originate from. So I think in that sense also, it is essential to find the origin of the virus and also going forward, you know, if there are other mutations, there are other strains, 
There are other pandemics. I think we can definitely prepare ourselves much better and find as to how to go about it than uh, sort of, you know, be uh, shooting okay. in the dark so, you know, as we have been doing for the last one, one year. You've raised an interesting point and I'll take it across to our scientific experts in just a bit. But let me just also bring in Abhijit Ayer Mitra uh, on mm -hmm. this conversation. Abhijit, in absence of scientific evidence, uh, uh, are there other methods and, you know, a lot of those studies that have uh, now uh, emerged in various parts of the world that simply are trying to join the dots, simply are trying to speak about what some of the scientists were trying to say um, or for the fact that, you know, people like uh, uh, Peter Zosnack uh, tried to dismiss this theory very early on. Later on, it emerged that he had a direct link with this Chinese lab where the research was going on. And so it was in his interest, perhaps, to not let this information out. Um, documents or, or the Chinese attempts to uh, cover up. Is all of that going to be enough for us to find the answer to this big question? Look, there's enough circumstantial evidence now to show that this did come out of the Wuhan lab. It did not transmit uh, from a wet market. And we also know that the entire notion of this coming from pangolins was a completely concocted story that was deliberately placed in certain medical journals to deflect attention. Now, uh, I think one of the previous speakers said, you know, lab leaks happen. Well, lab leaks do happen. The issue is they don't cause a complete global economic meltdown, and they don't end up killing 3 million people when they do happen. Now, the issue here is that with China and all, you, you know, it would have been so easy for China to just say, oops, we did this, now let's fix it. They went on shutting down information left, right, and center, throwing people in jail. Mind you, when uh, the early uh, 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 whistleblowers started speaking about in China, they were thrown in jail. When the lady who conducted the gain-of-function research, uh, she always used to allude to it because her first paper on this was regarding bats in mines and uh, how miners were getting sick with an early version of this. She used to keep deflecting it to somewhere else. And you could gain a lot of you know, uh, 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 information from what was not said, but extrapolated from what she wrote, that there was serious gain-of-function uh, research happening on this particular virus. Now, why does this matter? Because... The WHO and every other investigative agency was denied access to information. So what was a mistake of omission actively became a crime of commission. So whether it was, uh, uh, you know, if you have proof or not of lab leak, you definitely have proof of information suppression, which led to severe consequences later on. Now, why is it important? Why is finding that patient X important? Because it's very, uh, you know, when you don't know what the origin is, you start finding, looking for different uh, 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 solutions, different answers. It leads you up a garden path. The earliest example of this was that when we knew at a certain point that this was airborne, the WHO had a particularly nasty meeting with physicists. And because they had a 1944 definition of what constitutes airborne based on five microns or something like that, uh, they just refused to update their manuals to update what airborne implies. So this was mistake number one, which could have been corrected had you had certain kinds of information come out of there, number one. Number two, because of this, you then have people like Fauci and uh, uh, Dr. Tedros of the WHO. Actually, there are still tweets up on their timeline saying, do not wear masks. Yeah. All right. The belief was that it was washing your hands and things like that. That is how you were getting it, which uh, uh, the, the nature of the virus that we now know uh, was completely different. Right. So first, there is a very, even if there is no proof of uh, uh, hard evidence, there is huge amount of circumstantial evidence, certainly enough for a court conviction. And having worked on biological weapons, I can tell you that it is enough of Cassis Belly to declare war based on certain, some of these things that it happened in a no, terrorist but let me ask or a that. weaponized uh, scenario. Uh, one second, so Sandy, let me uh, quickly complete the point. Uh, what happens here is we can say with certainty that this was not a bioweapon, we can also say with some certainty that this was a leak. It wasn't an intentional, uh, 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 you, you know, uh, uh, putting out of the virus. However, however, and this is a very important point, the way in which China then used its influence, and this is the particularly bad part, is the absolute corruption of the entire global health system as it is. 
be it the WHO that is compromised to China or severe conflict of interest, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation against severe conflict of interest, Peter Gazak and the uh, Eco Health Alliance against severe conflict of interest, directly linked to Dr. Fauci against severe conflict of interest. It has now been proven that he lied repeatedly to congressional hearings. There is definitely a case to be made for perjury out there. Uh, th there is a complete sequence here where, uh, you know, all of these people are coming together to hide up their original crime or sin or whatever, to the extent that Basak went to go around bullying Lancet, use it as a bullying pulpit to, yeah. uh, you know, go after his... No, so that's exactly the question and I was then, trying to ask you, Abhijit. To say he, he that these see, look like attempts of cover-up, to publish, uh, you know, so to intentionally publish uh, articles in Lancet or letters in Lancet to dismiss a version that you may or may not want to believe in doesn't necessarily prove, doesn't necessarily prove a leak at the lab. It doesn't. Absolutely. To so say that Fauci is connected to, uh, 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 you know, Peter Wozniak or, or, or to the WHO or to Bill and Melinda Foundation or to the Chinese lab, will still not prove that uh, this there was a leak on of a virus that they were working on how so do you how do you so but you sound extremely evidence. convinced that there was a leak so i'm asking yes. you where is the evidence for that uh, there is a lot of evidence if you look at it which is all circumstantial it is not direct evidence yeah all right but what we do have beyond all reasonable doubt is that China converted what should have been an error of omission into a crime of commission, number one. Correct. And number two, the entire global so-called health from academia, uh, from doctors who were getting death threats for saying uh, uh, lab leak theory, to uh, publications including Lancet, to the so-called angel investors like uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to the actual bureaucracy, WHO, where we all know Dr. Tedros won his election, incidentally, India voted for him because the Chinese kind of uh, shoved him down the throat. And we also know that the elections in the WHO are a complete part because, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, guy who ran against him, the British fellow, had his wedding in Geneva, and all these guys were attending that wedding. There were only 25 people there. They were all attending the wedding. It's a closed cartel. Correct. It's a completely self-referential ecosystem where everybody is linked to everybody. You lose your job in one place, you need it to get the job in another place. And it works as a cartel. It is a fundamental antitrust body, and they suppress the way Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation sets the uh, discourse for what medical papers get published, what is kosher, what is not, and completely exclude, persecute, and harass people who don't okay. follow that. Okay. Or okay. Or that's a significant criminality. Okay, circumstantial evidence is Abhijit Ayer Mitra. But I do want the two scientific experts to now come into this because he's raised a lot of questions on how the community itself may have worked together to cover up, not just China. Uh, Dr. Ram, uh, Ganga Khedkar, do you want to come in on that? Oh, <laughs> I, do, I don't see any science, uh, scientific evidence that will suggest to me that all of them came together, ganged up and did this thing. It's very difficult for me to say that because these are basically some kinds of allegations that we can make. As I said, it is important that you have to put up the same pressure all through over China because even whether this has actually happened or not happened, how it had happened, all those stories could be different. But the world has to learn one lesson. The lesson is, if such a thing happens, you know what they are expected to do? The world has to learn a lesson that how to prevent occurrence of such an event. Mm. But at the same time, you know, when we are trying to deliberate on these issues, we must also be cognizant of the fact that given that one and a half years has passed, from the from the so-called you know, first reports as such of uh, the cases, you know, it's unlikely that you will get a very strong evidence. Okay. But it is possible you might go there and you might ask, let's say, whether that incident was reported in the laboratory, because all such accidents have to be reported in the laboratories as accidents. What action was taken? You could also try and see what were the employers, uh, the employees' records, medical records that were present there. 
because you always immunize them and when you immunize them appropriately when you work in bsl labs you would also keep that sample stored you know, for subsequent uh, analysis if it is required so you could take out those blood samples and now we know that uh, how to test you no know, how to try and find out even okay. whether there were certain kinds of antibodies that were present no we would we would find different means if they open up for investigation if they open up and, and if they haven't destroyed it yet dr ganga khedkar if they haven't destroyed it yet uh, you know including all the digital imprint that may have been from what happened at that point if there were scientists who should have spoken up then probably they did we would have never heard about it is also a possibility when it comes to china we don't know but i do want to talk about one other aspect that abhijit raised uh, and dr vinita bal uh, you know to say that well we didn't know initially you know to what extent was this virus airborne <clears throat> um and there were varying advisories that emerged from who to from no mask to now double mask now can that be construed as also who's uh failures or uh being part of the conspiracy or is it simply that the virus is evolving and is still so very new that everybody is grappling to find information about it i don't think that this is a fair question in the sense uh, this virus was new airborne and other forms of so everybody knew it was getting transmitted via air in which form was something that was not properly described but this is learning on the job as more and more information started pouring in the uh, advisories given by the authorities have changed over a time and sometimes they do look contradictory but i think there is wisdom in in modifying the advisories that you are giving based on data again i am harping on having solid data and not circumstantial or simply associative evidence that was emphasized upon i understand that in social science in international relations and when you are talking about many other things the the so, uh, circumstantial evidences can be used but yes. what one has to remember that what information was released at the beginning and what guidelines were issued subsequently there was enough data collected over a period of time and that has been useful and i'll give a, so a strange uh, i'll give you an example i keep saying this that if i were caught if i had very severe covid-19 disease in march 2020 as against march 2021 chances of my survival in 2021 were much higher not because the virus was mutated or anything mm. but because in that past one year clinicians have acquired enough expertise to treat the same serious patient in a much better way so the advisories have changed even for clinicians for physicians who are treating is that good bad and or ugly i think it is really good and in that sense while who might have gone wrong initially many people other people also have gone wrong initially but that they have open mind to at least accept and modify is a good sign rather than bad sign okay fair enough so those are the two sides of it the two viewpoints of it i want to pick up on one other thing that was raised here oh, and abhijit gave a lot of examples uh, uh, professor pant on how china did cover up how china didn't share information how china wasn't transparent uh, about several aspects of it and that's just made the entire battle for the whole world more difficult it's put us in more danger uh, and, and probably cost us life to that extent we still haven't seen a larger united global response why is that and can that really happen can india play a role there uh, i think uh, you know we are we are looking to see we are beginning to see some kind of a response now with countries which are calling for independent investigation uh, america has started calling for its own uh, review but i think the point that abhijit made uh, which i think is a very important one in some respects not simply about scientists but also uh, or or uh, medical professionals but i think an entire elite coming to a consensus that somehow uh, china has to be absolved of of its responsibilities in the, in this initial phase you know if you look at when donald trump raised this point early on uh, about chinese culpability 
it he was almost drowned out uh, by the voices that suggested no this is not possible that we have we now have a consensus almost we were told that you know experts have a consensus on this issue of how this uh, how this crisis uh, has emerged what are the sources when we now know that no such consensus existed and it was an artificially concocted consensus so i think the challenge here is that china's deep pockets has allowed china to involve itself in so many ways in so many institutions in so many functional groups uh, in so many categories that now i think it is becoming very difficult for the world and for the global order to respond to any such challenge and this is where the problem lies and i think this is where the challenge in the future will lie because if this is not resolved satisfactorily at the moment then the challenge will be that eventually countries will go and resolve it on their own so from now on i don't think anyone will believe anything that china says when it comes to issues of global governance or issues of uh, you know health health infrastructure or any of that uh, or, or any of these issues because clearly uh, we know that it, it is capable of not only lying but it is capable of manipulating a range of institutions towards its own ends mm. so the challenge and as you are rightly pointing out we have not seen a concerted effort again partly because china is able to break the ranks divide and rule but i think uh, like minded countries increasingly are coming together towards this consensus and i would also argue that india on its own should also have its own intelligence conducting an independent assessment of what really happened we should not rely on others like the americans are doing their own assessment but i think we should not wait we should do our own internal assessment of what actually happened in wuhan to the extent that we can given the evidence that we have and also take measures to respond if any such thing happens in the future which in my opinion is more likely than ever that it will repeat itself but which we should i completely agree with you but i think we are far far away from doing any of those things uh, in reality i mean uh, unfortunately that's how it exists right now maybe in the future that situation will change thank you so much it's been great pleasure to have all five of you on this conversation various aspects from you know how to handle it scientifically to diplomatically what is it that the world's response should be fact is we don't know enough there are many individual indicators here and there if you want you could join the dots to believe that this was indeed a leak from a chinese lab that was working on this virus and you know uh, creating it for humans if you don't want to you can continue believing that it came from the bats the evidence exists on both sides difficult to say right now which which side is really speaking the truth but the one way of finding that out would be a lot more of investigation a concerted attempt by countries across the world in uniting to find out that yes we do want to find out the truth how many countries would want to do that is a different game how many of the countries would actually want to take up the stand and question china on this kind of a research while they may be carrying out such research in their own homes is also a question we must keep in mind how many of the associations scientific organizations would really want a lot of this truth to come out we don't know there is too much at stake here at every level from individual organizations to even governments and perhaps not just that of china we'll wait and watch how this story unfolds and if indeed us intelligences who've been now tasked to find out more are able to come up with more details thank you so much for joining us on this conversation